All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Normally I like to wait just a few more minutes, but it looks like we're pretty packed. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to an allocated space. I'm sorry I'm not dressed like a pirate. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> that, I'm not that outgoing or confident. Like I, I wish I could pull it off like my boy Gomi and, uh, and Tarkovs over there. But it is international topic. Exactly, yeah. I wish I could pull it off, but I'm, I'm not that great. Um, so uh, we are a makerspace, hackerspace. We're a, a nonprofit 501c3. Um, everything you see here has been donated by the community. So uh, everything here with a, a handful of exceptions or, or uh, everything here is free to use. With a handful of exceptions, we just ask like, if you don't know how to use it, you ask somebody to get trained first. For instance, like the 3D printers or the laser cutter. But everything is free to use, so you can feel free to show up, uh, use whatever you'd like. Uh, and if you do use like a bunch of PLA or something like that, we ask that you replace it. But otherwise, everything is up, is up because it's all being donated. Um, so we're here to foster uh, knowledge and growth. So if you would like to, Contribute to that. We encourage everybody here. If you like what you see, you like what we do, uh, get involved. You can donate time, materials, equipment. You can do presentations like this. Uh, you can also donate financially. You can find us basically on like every single uh, social media out there. I need to pull Google. Uh, I think no, actually Google Groups is still good. But um, yeah, you can find us anywhere and uh, speak to one of our um, uh, folks like. Uh, I'm forgetting everybody's names. <laughs> you, you would be a good one to talk to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, about signing up and getting involved. And if you've never been here, ask for a tour. We'll show you everything that we got. So, sorry, I'm not feeling that great. So I'm trying to uh, trying to uh, work through this. So this is me. A uh, combined total of over 20 years between the various roles in IT and infosec. Uh, former full-time red teamer. I'm also on the MACCD, uh, MACCDC and, and uh, Cyber Patriot red teams. Uh, also on the Synac red team. I even made it through the big purge that Synac just did a few days ago, so I'm still in. Um, I've done red team consulting outside of uh, work in a part-time capacity. I'm also uh, a SANS mentor for 560 and 504. So uh, yeah, uh, there's a little bit of a trend here. I like offensive stuff. I like teaching, so um, I, I like doing this in my off time. <clears throat> So what we're going to talk about is an introduction to firmware exploitation. We're really just going to talk about software, kind of uh, reverse engineering and analysis. Um, I like this little image because Samsung is admitting that there might be viruses on your TV. So everyone's like, are you crazy? Why would you post that? Uh, I think they ended up taking that down shortly after. But you know, we're here trying to learn about making those viruses. So um, some, main re some main references for you. Um, Black Owl B1ACK0WL has a lot of really good references for like MIPS and uh, router reverse engineering, uh, exploit development, and found a lot of, uh, found some zero days and stuff like that. So uh, he has a few talks at DEF CON. I highly recommend if you're interested in this, take a look at some of his material. Um, I'm also going to mention, uh, uh, her handle is Fox One, but she has the Zeria Labs, and she has a lot of ARM specific stuff. Matter of fact, just recently she was starting a blog series on, I don't know if you heard about the 14 zero days for iOS that Google Project Zero found like a week or two ago. She was taking some of those publicly announced vulnerabilities and like walking through how to discover them and then how to write the exploits for them. So it's kind of a neat uh, thing she's doing here and it's, all, and it's free. She also does have paid classes, which me personally I'd love to take at some point. But I highly recommend you take a look at, um, at her uh, website as well. Um, all right, so we're here. What is actually, what is firmware? Basically, it's small, lightweight software, usually used in like uh, for common circuit boards. If you remember the old like BIOS for your, uh, or the old BIOS, the BIOS for all of our computers, <laughs> that, that is a type of firmware, bless you. And um, firmware, more often than not, completely resets when it loses power. So if you've ever like taken one of those little you know circular batteries out of your computer and then turned it off and turned it back on again, all your like time, your clock, all that stuff would be reset. Um, firmware usually has a read-only memory, which is where everything loads, and then there, there's a there's a write memory that's where configs might be loaded from, or when you change your password or set up your firewall, it might send a config file into the writable memory section. And sometimes, depending on the firmware, how it's being, uh, how it was designed. The firmware will either pull files straight from that writable memory every single time it boots, or there'll be a config file there that it parses through and then and it manages those configs. And we'll show some examples of that when we go through it. So uh, you see firmware in a lot of um, embedded devices. So what we're mainly going to be looking at here today is more like IoT type specific devices. You know, um, 
uh, Raspberry Pis, routers, um, refrigerators, microwaves, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever might have some embedded uh, software on it. There's a lot of different operating systems for firmware. These are the top five. You got like SquashFS, you got CRAM, JFS2, uh, YAFS2, and then uh, we also have like EXT. The reason why I bring these up is because um, it's not so important for us if we're doing analysis, but if you're an embedded developer, they're pretty important. How they manage like compressed data, how they do their boot process, how they do like flashing and everything. Those are all um, different between the file systems. But more importantly, for what we want to do, we're going to use, we're going to talk about a tool called Binwalk. And Binwalk uses external libraries to do a lot of its extraction of file systems. So <clears throat> if you're trying to extract a SquashFS file system from a binary file, Binwalk needs you to install the external library to do that. So knowing the different types of file systems that you can run into will come in handy. So then when you see it, like I didn't list the Ubiquiti file system, like yeah, UBIFS. But um, if you see a system like that, you're like, oh, that's weird, and you try to extract it, and Binwalk fails, you may need to go get the external library that's designed to parse that out. So uh, just know that there's different file systems. If you run into issues extracting them, you might need to do something like that. All right, so we talked a little bit about firmware. How do we acquire it? So um, the easiest way is download it from a website. A lot of, operate, a lot of um, manufacturers will put uh, firmware on their website. Um, you can also try to extract it from the device using like a JTAG or UART. We won't talk about that here because that's heavily hardware focused and something that I need to spend more time on myself. But uh, from my understanding, JTAG is how you could actually extract the uh, firmware off of the device if you don't have access to the actual software. And then uh, UART is almost like an admin console, like a console into the device so you can um, actually interface with it directly. <coughs> So you could try to extract it that way too, uh, too. In this situation, on the picture on your left, those uh, those ten pins is where maybe like a JTAG connector would go for uh, for a DDWRT router. And on the right, um, that is another. It's like 16, 18 pins for a JTAG connector. Wow. So when you look at them, sometimes you might see the pins desoldered. You may actually have to resolder the pins back on there in order to connect your connector. There's also like. Um, clips that you can just put straight onto the chip that you're trying to extract the firmware from. So there's a lot of different devices out there, a lot of, little, a lot of different hardware solutions. It really just depends on what you're um, an, uh, analyzing and what you're trying to extract. Um, the last one is you can actually sniff it over the air during the uh, update process. So I just have a picture of a tap here, but in theory you can also point your device at a proxy that, that captures everything um, like man and mill style. And you can just proxy everything and capture the update, capture the firmware while it's being passed. So that's another way uh, that you can do it. Talk about downloading the firmware. Another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these products, whether it's you know a big name like Netgear or Asus, or even like smaller devices like Samsung, you know, refrigerators, they use a lot of open source libraries. And what they'll do is if they modify that library according to the license. They're supposed to post the source code for the GPO uh, license uh, software that they use. So if you look up like Samsung GPL, you might find a website that has all the open source libraries that they use and the modifications that they did to that library. And for the purposes of research and analysis, this is really handy because when we look at a net here like this, you may see like a web browser that you get to when you, when you plug into it, but you don't know what that web browser is running unless you uh, see like the banner. And you're like, okay, it's running HTTPD. So is it the default HTTPD that you just go from GitHub? Or is it something that they modify and then put onto their device? And when they modified it, did they do something wrong? Did they use an old vulnerable library? Did they use like functions that, the, that they shouldn't use? And so if you look at the GPL license software, you can just try to grab the source code. And you don't need to reverse it, you just read it. And uh, oftentimes, it's documented and commented very well. So. Um, really easy way to do code review and static analysis of their code without having to actually reverse, you know, reverse anything. So I would always look for that first, depending on the device that you're looking at. So this one is a TP-Link GPL page. <coughs> um, I also went and downloaded the FIOS Quantum Gateway software. So if you have FIOS, all of Verizon's BIOS devices are now open source, so you can actually go and grab every single every single piece of software that's on the, the BIOS routers now, straight from their website. 
Um, this is also where you can just grab the Ubiquiti actual firmware. Just go to the Ubiquiti website and grab it. So a lot of these companies uh, post all their uh, software online. Just go get it. The only time I think you would really have to use hardware to grab it is if you're working on like a proprietary system. Like, um, what was that one that McAfee sponsored not too long ago? That was like a crypto, uh, crypto a Bitcoin watch or wallet, like something like that, right? You're probably not gonna find the software for that online. You probably have to crack that open and JTAG the, the firmware off of that. And then um, uh, also, uh, Black Owl did this damn vulnerable router firmware if you just wanna play around. This has some intentionally vulnerable things in it. And it's intended so that you can actually flash it onto a router and play with it as if it was an actual device, but you can also emulate it. And you can also um, just look at the, uh, the, uh, the firmware by itself. So I also recommend taking a look at that. Excuse me. All right, so you grab some firmware. You either have a binary file, and um, now what are we gonna do with it? So uh, I mentioned a tool called Binwalk, and you can use Binwalk to basically do like magic header analysis on the file. So the binary, uh, Binwalk will, bring, will, walk through the bi uh, will walk through the binary, look for any headers that appear to be like a file system, and then extract that file system. You can do recursive extractions where it'll, every single header it'll find, it'll recursively pull everything out, and, then, and it'll look in there, and if you see something, it'll, it'll pull that out as well. So if you have like a binary file that has a zip file that has a squashfs file in it, it'll pull all three of those out for you to analyze. So uh, again, Binwalk does do a lot of its uh, extraction based on external libraries. So if you're extracting firmware for something that it doesn't recognize, go look it up and see if you need to pull like a SquashFS tool or something that Binwalk needs to extract that. And in this screenshot, um, I was extracting the Netgear software. And you can see that it pulls out, um, you can see that it pulls out a couple of zip archives. And then if you keep going, it, it would end up pulling out the, uh, the file system itself. And once the file system is extracted, you can see it looks just like a Linux system. And a lot of these do. They all look like just small, lightweight Linux systems. Um, you have to keep in mind that if you're looking at the actual binary extraction, some of the files would exist in a writable memory and some will be just read only. So like the Etsy shadow and Etsy password, once the system is, once like you boot up your net here, it usually takes those and put them in the, uh, the read only section. So even if you could like access them, you may not be able to write to them even if you're a root. Or if you were root and you could write to them, when you reset the, uh, the system, it'll go right back to the way it was originally because it's pulling that, that system, the, uh, the files from the right only. So um, firmware will reset back to its original state <clears throat> for any changes that weren't made in the right only memory. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So now that we've extracted, let's talk about a couple strings. So you can do some basic analysis at this point. You've extracted your file system. You can run strings on different um, binaries to see what might be interesting. In this case, I'm running a grep for Telnet because I'm always curious if Telnet's open or if Telnet can be turned on, if it even has the binary in there. And so you can run uh, like a, grep, a recursive grep for Telnet in that, in that uh, file structure and see what comes out. Uh, in this case, there was a uh, script, where is it? sbin internet dot, uh, sh, so it was like an internet shell script that came up that had telnet in it. So I would dig into that a little bit further. Uh, let me see. There's the internet sh uh, shell script that was found. And so in there you can kind of see where it, it has like default settings for like the LAN interface is gonna be BR0. But then you see like setup username and password. So the MVRAM get 20, 2860, I think is referencing like a memory section of the MVRAM. So that's going to get pulled once the device is actually turned on. <clears throat> and um, so that kind of gives you an idea, maybe depending on the device, does it have hard-coded default creds? Does it have some creds that are loaded from memory from another location? Is that memory pulled from a file that I need to find somewhere else? So um, this is kind of be a way that you can look for anything that you can easily exploit, like just basic stuff. And this is looking for anything admin password. And you can see that there were a bunch of uh, that admin password references. Uh, change password.sh, the internet.sh. There's a default VLAN, admin password equals. So that's how you can just do some really quick strings and grepping action to look for anything that might be interesting. You can also look for you know, SSH, or the SSH keys. You can look for, um, yeah, passwords, usernames. You can look for um, any services that might be kind of weird. Um, 
So in this case, if you were um, looking at the at the binary information, you see that there's an IPCAM default config for this D-Link device. So this is literally the config that's loaded by default when that device is first turned on. So you can go into here and you can kind of see, okay, is Telnet turned on by default? In this case, admin and admin uh, ad user uh, ID, the admin ID is admin, the admin password is blank. So that tells me that by default there might be no password. All right, that's good to know. Um, you can also go in there, you see camera name is DS5030L. So maybe I do like a banner search on Shodan for DCS5030L. And I see how many of them may have Telnet exposed to the internet, right? And then now I might have the easy default credits that I could use. So <clears throat> that's where some of these default configs come in handy. It might give you some low hanging fruit for stuff you're gonna look at. All right, so this is the Netgear uh, software. Looking for Telnet again, found a, uh, 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 an update underscore user script. And looking at that under underscore user script, you can see that the um, it's removing the password gshadow and shadow files, like it's unsetting the configs. And then it's echoing the root, guest, nobody, and the daemon uh, users into the files. So this is like all the initial setup when the device first gets turned on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and then it adds, actually adds admin admin to um, you know the FTP admin group, and uh, yeah, a few other things. So you can see as you go through the device, just doing some quick strings and grepping, you can see um, maybe some default configs or where um, some interesting information may lie for you to dig further. So it's kind of, you have to get creative with what you're gonna look for and what you're trying to do there. If you're doing like vulnerability research, maybe you're trying to see if there's an actual like backdoor account that nobody really knows about. And it's there, but it's just not turned on. Okay, so what if I turn it off? How hard would that be? Or maybe you're looking for, um, maybe you're looking at a device your company's producing. Are they leaving any sort of admin accounts or services or things that shouldn't be there? So this is where just some simple grepping can come in. So if you actually have the binary, you can also look at individual files. So I mentioned like HTTPD earlier. Um, a lot of these use uh, common programs in their implementations but the vendor may have made some changes. So in this case, like I was looking at the light uh, HTTPD program used from a, from a uh, Ubiquiti uh, video camera. So I actually you know, extracted, the, extracted the firmware. Using Radar 2, you can do like a, tri a triple A, which kind of does an analysis on all the, uh, the functions. <clears throat> and then you can do uh, AFL, which kind of lists all your functions. Or you can do AFL looking for specific function names. So like in this case, do an AFL off. So looking for any function that maybe have, has off in the name of the function. You can see that there's like um, uh, off backend get, off that backend set. You may need AFL password or AFL login, um, AFL cookie, you know, stuff like that. Try to think of some function names that might be relevant to the type of research that you're doing. Especially if you're looking at like light HTTPD, that's obviously going to be the web interface. So I'm looking at either the web interface on the LAN side and potentially the WAN side if it's uh, pushed to the WAN, which hopefully it isn't. But if it is, that's where some of your vulnerability um, research is really gonna play a big part. Because if a web server is exposed to the WAN side, anybody on the internet can hit it. And then that's when this kind of research will come more, be more important. If it's on the LAN side, it's still bad, but I'm already on your network, there's worse things I could probably do but it's still worthy to report. Um, I'm also gonna talk about Ghidra, <laughs> because Ghidra's kinda new. Uh, there's a lot of uh, presentations on it, so if you wanna learn like, deep dives about Ghidra, by all means, look up like DEF CON, and um, you know, any number of other talks, people have done a lot of Ghidra uh, talks. But I wanna bring this up specifically because they were talking about using Ghidra to reverse ARM versus like IDA, and this is the kind of stuff they were talking about. So Ghidra and ARM, both have a disassembler built in, and that's really hard to see up here on the screen, but I can't zoom it in either. Uh, basically, on the right-hand side, none of the functions have names. None of the variables are actually named or assigned. It just looks like a mess. It looks like Ida on the right-hand side like has no idea what it's actually looking at, whereas Ghidra on the left actually picks out all the variables. It actually has the uh, function names in there and um, actually has more information looking like an actual C program. So it, the disassembly in Ghidra was a lot better. And specifically for ARM, it's a clear winner in this case, and Ghidra's free, so I like that. Um, so if you're gonna be looking at embedded devices. 
highly recommend maybe use Ghidra, um, especially if you're just getting you, you uh, just getting into it and you want a free tool that you can do some disassembly and uh, static analysis. Uh, Ghidra also has some multi-architecture uh, support. So like I said, it can do MIPS, it can do ARM, it can do x86, x64. <coughs> The right-hand side is where your disassembled code is. So if you find a function, like you go to main and you double-click it, it'll automatically try to disassemble it for you. So it tries to read all the function names and tries to disassemble it into C code for you on the right-hand side. You can also uh, look for your function and import to the left-hand side. So maybe a function for a system. Uh, does, your, does your router have a ping function? And if it does, does it ping straight to the operating system or does it do something like internally? So um, look for our system calls when it actually drops a variable or information to the actual uh, shell, like bin, bin shell, to run ping, right? Is that vulnerable to an exploit or to some sort of a command injection? So you can look for system, you can look for you know, sprint, look for all the vulnerable functions that you think might be in there. Um, one of the nicer features is also kind of like IDA where it has a, cold, a code block flow so if you open up, um, let's say you open up main, which is like basically what that bottom right hand is, and this is a light HTTPD. So I think I pulled this off of this net here, maybe even my Asus at home, I don't remember. But um, you can actually throw it into Ghidra and then say, you know, map the function for me, and it'll map every single jump and branch and every single type of uh, function that's in there, every instruction. So if you're looking for something specific, like how does the program handle this variable when I put it in there? If I overflow this field, what's going to happen? You can see that entire execution there with Gija. It does that again. It's all free. So that's kind of cool. I like that. That's more static analysis. So the problem that we often run into is that when you want to look at a single binary, it's obviously it's for a different architecture. You're probably running on a you know x86 or 64 um, Linux box, and I want to emulate a MIPS or an ARM binary. So there's a QEMU program that you can use. So what I did was I pulled a, uh, I extracted the damn vulnerable router firmware, and then in that uh, you can see like a bin busybox file, which busybox is basically like a Swiss Army knife program, and you can compile busybox with different applets based on your need. So some manufacturers compile busybox with bare minimum stuff. Some manufacturers, I see them compile busybox with netcat. Why would they have Netcat on there? I don't know, but they do. Mm -hmm. So um, it varies wildly uh, for the manufacturer. <clears throat> but we're going to, in this series of slides, I emulate BusyBox because that tells you right out the gate kind of some of the native capabilities that are on there. So I'm first doing a read help to kind of figure out what the operating system is. About six lines down, you can see it's a MIPS uh, R3800, uh, little Indian. So I know it's a MIPS little Indian uh, binary. Using a QEMU, you can actually statically try to um, execute that binary. And what will end up happening more often than not is it'll, it'll fail because all binaries are um, dynamically linked, they're not statically uh, compiled. So it'll fail looking for like, um, like a libc uh, uh, object. <clears throat> so what you can do is you can actually um, chirrut that binary telling it like this is the root directory you want to execute the binary from. That way that reference actually works. And so if you chirrut the, if you chirrut the execution with queuing you, then you'll see the results of actual BusyBox running at the bottom here. And in this case, this looks pretty minimal, uh, minimal. Like I don't see a whole lot in there, reboot. You see reboot on basically everything because every box has to reboot. But that's why a lot of like POCs, if you go on like exploit DB, almost all of them have reboot because that's almost guaranteed to be on the target, and if you get code execution on target and it reboots, it's a really great test to see if your code execution worked. Almost every, I've never run into one that doesn't have reboot. So um, that's on there. But uh, other than that, yeah, in this one, for this damn vulnerable router uh, software, there's kind of a lot on there. Netstat, ping, almost every target will have wget or tftpt, uh, tftp as well because the, uh, the, the box, the, the router, the device has to do updates. So it has to have some mechanism to pull for, uh, firmware from a remote server. So almost all um, software that I've seen, all embedded software will have some mechanism to pull firmware, which will come in handy when we, come, when we start doing our, um, our remote debugging. But this one does have ping. This one, uh, this one has ping. Yeah, it has ping and ping six. And you can see it also has wget. 
So yeah, most all of them will have W. Yeah, this one actually has Telnet D too. Wait, so sorry, you brought up the fact that paint it does paint you differently going to the OS versus. Mm. So if you're, um, so the question was about how I mentioned that ping uh, is different. Um, that depends on that that browser software, right? So if you go to your router and you log in, if there's like a maintenance or diagnostic page, sometimes they have a ping block or a trace route block. How that is handled can be different sometimes. Like, is it is it something where they take that static string and they pass it straight to the operating system, or do they just take whatever you feed it? And they don't bound it or they don't take it literally. Okay. So then you can inject like pipes and stuff into that. But that one's our normal ping. Yeah, and that's just a normal ping. And what I would do is most uh, most all targets, if they're going to have, or not all targets, all um, firmwares, if they're going to have uh, a ping function, they should have it in, in BusyBox. But I have seen some web pages, some of those admin pages, they don't have a trace route or ping option. So they may not actually have a compiled in BusyBox in that case. Can you make that any bigger? I cannot, but what I can do, yeah, unfortunately I can't. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of maxed out. But what I can do is uh, I'm gonna put these slides into our uh, share drive right here after we're done. Uh, so you can take a look there. And then what I do wanna do is when I come back in the next week or so, I'll actually get bring my VM that I use for doing a lot of this stuff, and I'll drop it there as well. So I'll make a, I'll make a folder for you know firmware talk, and I'll just drop the stuff in there. So uh, yeah, after the talk, I'll drop it in there real quick. Uh, there's another tool called Firmadyne, and what it's supposed to do is take a, a binary file, a firmware binary file, extract the entire thing, and um, basically emulate the entire operating system. And so I've seen it work on one piece of firmware. Uh, so I wanted to mention it because it is out there. I actually have a video of it doing the emulation that I'll play here in a second. But I don't know how well supported the, the project is. If you're interested and you are a coder, by all means, please support this because emulation is a bear and it's probably the biggest issue when it comes to doing some of this research. Um, I always recommend if you have a device, that's the easiest way. Give me, a, give me a device any day of the week because then I can get on it, I can reset it, I can flash it, I can do everything else I want to do. If I have to do it be based just on a binary, like here, reverse it here, this, like it's gonna be it's gonna be nine times harder than it really has to be, at least for my level of, of experience. So um, to use Fermadine, basically it's a multi-step process. Uh, I'll show the video of it now. Yeah, give me a second. Yeah. All right. Sorry, there's no there's no awesome like music or anything. And for some reason, it's trying to go to AirPlay. I have no idea why. But basically, it's a multi-step process. Um, it basically extracts the firmware for you. It, um, it adds it to a database. It pulls the architecture. And then uh, runs a bunch of scripts to extract it. Uh, makes an actual image to mount it. And then it runs a process called an infer network, where it tries to mount the firmware and then try to, tries to figure out like what the IP address of the primary interface is. Um, in my video, I set it for 120 seconds, the default 60, but it fails sometimes on 60. Uh, actually, and then I skip it to here. And so basically, after it infers what the, um, what the IP address is, then you run a shell script that it creates, and it, it mounts the image, uh, sets up a virtual interface on your local machine, and points it at that interface for you to be able to manually uh, browse it with a web browser as if it was on your network. So, like I said, I'll have, I'll have the videos available. I'm sorry that my tablet seems to want to connect with AirPlay. So you don't know where the heck that, that's going. Um, yeah, somebody next door is like, what the heck is this video playing on my TV? Um, you got kids that. Yeah. <laughs>
So basically, once it, once it loads up everything up, here's an example of what it will look like. So you browse to it just like you normally would any other device, and it actually brings up the interface as if you, were, you had that device anyway, or had that device live on your network. Like I said, this piece of firmware is the only one I've got it to actually work with, uh, but if it does work with other ones, I've heard that there's a handful here and there that it might work with, um, that would be really nice. Because then you can actually try to do, you know, command injection on the login screen, you can try to do uh, some of the command injection for like ping or, or telling it or whatever like that. But you can live interface with, uh, with these, start with, these um, with the interface. And so I actually should mention that a lot of this research from what I've seen so far is a combination of skill sets. Like when I first look at a device, I like to look at the web server and do like a web test on it. So like I'll do a lot of the same things I would do on a website that I would on a device to, just to see what happens. What kind, of, what kind of cookies is it passing? What kind of input will it accept? Can I break that stuff? Can I fuzz that? <clears throat> Use something like BooFuzz or something against it? And just to see what happens. Um, sometimes firmware isn't written that well, so if, you, if it's using like a cookie to track your session, well, how, does it have a limit on how much I can give that cookie? And then if it doesn't, how much can I actually send it? Will it start overwriting stuff? So you'll find that there's a little bit of overlap in skill sets. Yes. You had said that it breaks to a database. Does it have a database of known firmwares that it actually uh, works with? No. So it, 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 it creates like a database locally on your system. So basically it'll be like if you run firmware one, it knows to talk to that database and use one as an index okay, and say, so I'm loading this information. It's not really like, I wish it was like a database you could reach out to and like, yeah, I'll pull that firmware and play with it. That would be nice. Um, no, but it handles. Yeah, like um, looking at the GitHub page, like I was trying to emulate an ubiquity video camera, like that'd be cool for a demo. And everybody on the GitHub page was like, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. I got this to kind of work. You got to make these changes. You got to write this. And so I was like, you know what? I just, I don't have time to do it for a demo. <clears throat> um, it, it will work on, on, on some other firmware, but it might be worth trying. I just don't have the time to really mess with it. I have enough to kind of go off of without Permadyne. But it's a, it's, it, it, it would be really nice. Um, this is kind of like my recent favorite. I like remote debugging. And so basically what you're doing is, if you can get like Telnet running on a device, which oftentimes you can. If I'm talking about doing research like, you know, white box. Like I have a device and I can actually uh, log into it, I can play with it. And so <clears throat> I can go into the admin console and I can, okay, I'm gonna turn on Telnet so I can get full access to the operating system while it's running and then I can do better uh, research that way, right? So um, there's, a, there's a GitHub page, uh, Hugsy is the author, has a bunch of GDB statics, uh, uh, static pre-compiled binaries. And so what you can do is uh, they, have, they have things like, uh, they have uh, I think two different versions of ARM, a couple different versions of MIPS, and then they have x86-64 uh, GDB server. And so if you can get Telnet turned on and actually get access to the box, whether it's through command injection that you discovered or whether you just go ahead and get, enable it through the, the admin prompt or the, um, you know, the, uh, the, main, uh, the web page, then you can go ahead and get one of these static binaries onto your system and then <clears throat> What you can essentially do is attach it to any running process and then remotely debug it from your own machine. And so that's really nice because then at that point, this is an example of, uh, uh, I, this is on my router at home. Uh, I'm basically looking for HTTPD. That's the software that runs the web server uh, on my home router. Uh, I probably shouldn't research my own router at home. If I break it, like I gotta buy it. But um, I'm using GDB server, the ARM v6. I think the actual um, operating system was ARM 7, but the v6 version worked. And so it kind of depends. You might have a little bit of flexibility. But I'm running GDB server. Uh, I'm telling it the IP address that, I, that, my, that my system is going to connect from, tell it what port to connect on, and I'm attaching it to process 254, which is the running web server. Right? So GDB then attaches itself to that web server, and it's ready to be debugged. Then on my other computer, I go ahead and you can download a GDB slash multi-arc, multi-architecture. So it can, um, it, can, it can read symbols and everything for multiple architectures like ARM and, and uh, MIPS, which is two of the, different, uh, two of the main architectures I've seen for, I, for um, these IoT type devices. <coughs> and then you can uh, remote, remotely connect to the server that you have set up. So in this case here, uh, it runs and then uh, the target remote IP address port, then it starts loading up all the symbols, 
You can set it so that it actually pulls that binary that it's attached to to a local temporary file on your local machine, so it can resolve the symbols as well. And then once you're in there, so I use a, an, ex, an extension that um, Azaria actually mentioned. It's like the GDB exploitation framework, G, uh, Jeff, G-E-F. And so it does a lot of this stuff, which is kind of nice. It has like a context window, so every time you hit a breakpoint, it tells you the stack, tells you what registers are being loaded, tells you um, where you are in your instruction set. It can also uh, link with things like Ropper, so you can look for like rock gadgets when you go and do your exploitation. <laughs> but um, that makes it a lot easier, because GDB to me is kind of plain. So like use like Pwn DBG, or uh, use Jeff, uh, or Jeff, Jeff, whatever the full name is. Uh, use one of those two. I would definitely recommend looking, into, looking into those. But once you get that remote debugger on there, you have access to basically debug any program that's running. And um, that could be really useful while you're sending those weird web requests, right? So if I have a debugger on there and I'm trying to log in, let's say I'm trying to see if the username and password fields have an overflow issue. I'll say admin tag or one equals one, whatever. Then when I hit enter, I can set a breakpoint on the main process. And then once main hits, I can look at my debugger and see is that actually excuse me, being sent to the program. If I'm sending it 5,000 A's, is that hitting registers it shouldn't be hitting? Is it overflowing or overwriting registers and memory addresses it shouldn't be writing? So um, that's how you can then do further research. <clears throat> uh, because you are remote debugging, a lot of the functions and the symbols usually get resolved. So you can actually do like info functions. And right here I'm looking for anything with password in it. So like in my router at home, maybe I shouldn't mention this, um, compare password in shadow, uh, let me see, uh, PK, PKCS12, new pass, uh, compare password in shadow, create open, B, uh, open VPN password, get pass, that one would be interesting, I want to take a look at. But these are all like functions that I can then take a look at in debug and I can see what's, what, what, what is hitting them, um, what, when I do certain things to the, to, the, to the web server, is it going through some of these functions, are there certain ways I can make it jump to other functions that I'm more concerned with. And from what I understand, which I'm still kind of working through myself, um, a lot of IoT exploitation, like MIPS and ARM, you're not going to find like some of the easy ones you do in x86. Like it's not like return to value and leave. Like it's not super easy. Like you've got to do rock gadgets because the way like MIPS does its a, a setup and teardown for its functions is way different from x86. The theories are still the same but just how to read the actual assembly and what you're going to try to overwrite and jump to is a little bit different. So um, there is no just return to libc and call it a day. Like you got to use rock gadgets to bounce around to actually get the execution you want. So uh, again, I recommend looking at Black Owl stuff. He talks about that a little bit in his blogs. Uh, definitely look into that. So here's a video of the remote debugger process. And so again, um, I've turned, I have the GDB server I downloaded from the uh, Hugsy GitHub page. Um, I'm basically setting up a Python server on that local share so that I can W get it. I'm telnetting into the device because I turned on telnet. I have access to it, so I'm just going to turn it on. And then from there, I just W get that GDB server file, and that's the one that's going to go on the remote system. You got to don't forget to shamod it, make it executable. It's not that um, by default. <coughs> And then uh, what I'm doing is I'm checking for HTTPD because I found out that uh, that's, the, that's the web server program that's being run. So then I'm attaching the GDB server to the, to the HTTP server. It looks like it's uh, listening on port 9191. So then I flip back to my local host and then I run that GDB multi-architecture uh, uh, command to connect to that remotely. So here's it's reading all the libraries. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's a command I didn't use, which I should have, it would have resolved a lot of those errors at the end, where it would actually pull the local file and look for the symbols there. But that's the context. That's where I'm running right now. I can set my breakpoints. I can uh, check the uh, functions. So that's all the function. Oh, no, that's all the functions with password in them. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you can see all the different registers that are being set, where I am in the instructions, in the code. <clears throat> you see the stack. Those are all the registers right there. So, um, oh yeah, and then you can use normal GDB commands as well. So that's looking at like the um, the value of the stack pointer. You can do like 20, uh, 20 <coughs> bytes plus or minus. You can play around with stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of stuff that I'm doing right there. But 
You can do all that live, hooked up to the device, and it won't crash anything. When you're done, you can just quit out of your GDB and the, and the HTTP server will still be running. And it's gonna be like, there's no problem. The only time it'll cause an issue is if you set a breakpoint and then someone else like browses to it, and then the breakpoint gets hit, and they're like, why isn't my server responding? So, um, you know, just keep that in mind if you're like in a shared environment, or if you're at home, and you're, you know, you're sitting on your other or whatever, your kids wanna go to the web browser. <coughs> All right, so I'm going through this way faster than I thought, I apologize, but this is the why does it just matter, right? Um, so we, I talk a lot about these specifically, these routers, just because one, um, they're cheap. Like I went and bought this at Best Buy for 50 bucks. I've been using it for like two years. I love it. Um, but you can just go check them out. You can do some research, you know, find some CVEs. Um, it's not like you can go on to Shodan and look up a Netgear like this, see if like port 21 is open on 7,700 devices on the internet, you know. It's, this isn't a big deal at all. Why would we want to care about anonymous login being granted to somebody? on the oh. internet. So, <laughs> yeah. so I mean, again, the land side vulnerabilities, when you plug in and you're authenticated or you're on the wireless, those are bad. Those are bad to, to, to report. But the WAN side, the one where you can access stuff on the internet side, that's really bad. That's this kind of stuff. Why do you have FTP exposed on the internet? Why would you have port 23 Telnet on a couple hundred devices for video cameras? exposed to the internet. Um, and that one specifically, actually the banner tells you what kind of device it is. So if you want to go buy a cheap camera at home and go play around, find out there's some remote code execution or author, uh, authentication bypass in it, then you go toss it in one of these bad boys and you have an exploit on your hands. Or, um, you know, like I mentioned, port 80 being exposed to the internet when it really shouldn't be. Uh, the first few searches I pulled, the whole thing, when I did Linksys port 80, all these smart Wi-Fi devices came up. Why is that on the internet? Why is port 80 being exposed there? Has anybody vetted those devices and looked at them? <clears throat> so um, a lot of these, you know, the cameras you get at home, the, the routers that you use at home, um, your refrigerator may have a web server. I don't know why I would, but they, they're, they're coming with them now. So just keep that in mind. This is why I think you can definitely play with this at home. You can find devices, you can mess around, and um, yeah, like take a look at them. Are there any questions? I went through that really fast. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm nervous to be recorded. So when you say um, ah. the share, is that is that that top? Are you going to post it to that? I'm going to put on that where it says share drive files dot uas. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put it so right I there. Have to come here to be on your local network to get. Yes. Yeah. You got to you got to be on the local Wi-Fi that we have. Okay. Um, we do have an open guest network. Feel free to come here. Put it on that Google poster. Oh no no no! I'm sorry. That's an old one. I don't know what that's for. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, if, you can also see the share drive over there, files at UAS slash UAS storage slash incoming. Mm -hmm. That's where I put my oh, old red team boot, boot camp. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what I'll do is I will bring the VM that I used for all this with the remote debugging stuff with the um, with Gator already installed. It's open source, I don't care. Um, and then a bunch of the Binwalk tools, uh, already installed libraries and, and all those static compiled libraries. And I'll bring that, I'll drop it into that storage drive under like a firmware folder. So if anybody wants these slides and that VM, I'll bring it when I'm back here probably next week sometime. So feel free to come by and take a look. Um, yeah, that was really fast. I'm sorry, guys. Are there any questions? Thanks for coming out. If you do have questions, you can at me on Twitter. You can hit me up in the UAS chat. I'm there. And uh, if you have any suggestions or anything you're working through, I probably know folks that are much better at this than I am. So if uh, you do have questions, you know, holler at me. <clears throat> Otherwise, thanks for coming out, and happy Pirate Day. <laughs> <laughs>